here is New York. Commuters give the city its title restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity, but the settlers give it passion. E.B. Waite would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at the Elizabeth Collective, historic mansion in Midtown, New York, where art and design live together, curated by Maison Gerard. Welcome to Harvest Dialogues. One of the most intriguing projects that will turn New York into the world's leading mecca of urban green design is a dry line. It comes to protect lower Manhattan from floods, typically caused by storms, while also expanding the public space along the waterfront. This intriguing project is led by a Danish architectural firm, Beg, under the leadership of Kai Bergman. Hi, Kai. Hi, Danielle. So, construction starting soon. It is, actually, in uh, 2020. This after a six-year design period. And what is a dry line? The dry line is conceived as a means to think uh, into the future and protect uh, Manhattan um, towards incoming sea level rise and the increasing storm events. And it was developed as a part of a competition that was seeking for innovative solutions to protect places affected by Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, actually, um, this was back uh, when Superstorm Sandy um, arrived. And uh, at that time, the Obama administration um, could see that there was money being set aside for the, um, in a way, fixing of all of the damage that Sandy had uh, uh, created. However, there was also the intent to do something about this uh, idea of resiliency. So $1 billion was set aside um, and uh, ideas were to come from the design community as to how to think about not only fixing what had been damaged, but also thinking about the root causes of the damage. You're going to add a lot of public space yes. to Lower Manhattan. Well, the, the uh, extent of the Big U is actually 10 miles along uh, from sort of East 23rd Street down along the tip of Manhattan and then back up into the 40s or uh, 50s of the West Side. So we felt that we should be investing in the resiliency of our city but we should at the same time be investing in the open space. And I know your company, Big, is huge on sustainability. How, how do you envision this project as a part of the philosophy of Big regarding social infrastructure and sustainability? So uh, social infrastructure is actually a great term to frame it because the infrastructure is around us every single day, from power plants to flood protection, um, and is most often uh, kind of gray on maps, or also it's not something that you want to live around. Who wants to live around a power plant? We look at ways for those same infrastructures to have a social dimension, so that people actually see the benefit of having flood protection in their neighborhood. If you think just 50 years ago, most of the coastline was actually for commerce, uh, for cruise ships, and for uh, goods coming in. So all of the warehouses were on the edge of the, of the city. Uh, New York has changed tremendously since that time. And now the edge of the city is actually one that people would like to come to. I want to conclude with a question about about New York. So you are not from New York originally. No, I'm one of its many immigrants. Uh, my family actually came in 1976 across on the Queen Elizabeth uh, II, and my first sight as a six-year-old was the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty. And you are very aware of the DNA, the urban DNA of New York City as being envisioned by the master builder Robert Moses. Absolutely. Do you see the dry line 
uh, as a fit to that program. So we, we actually see that the big U uh, and the dry line uh, in many ways is an infrastructure project on the scale of what Robert Moses was thinking in the city of New York and also the five boroughs. However, we see that Robert Moses was mostly in way of sort of building roadways, building beaches, building uh, uh, tunnels and bridges. So he was an engineer. And what was missing was the sort of Jane Jacobs uh, thinking of what is the street life, what is the neighborhood, what is the social context. And, and also, can I add a 21st century addition to that program? The Eames House, home and studio of America's favorite star designers of the mid-century, could not have received a better gift for its 70th anniversary. A new conservation management plan was recently completed and published by both the Eames Foundation and the Getty Conservation Institute. Frank Escher and Ravi Gunawardena, the architects responsible for the first phase of conserving the Eames House, are here with us from California. So welcome to New York. How are you? Thank you. Uh, great. The Eames House was completed in 1949 as a part of the Case Study House program, and which came to propose new ways of residential living lifestyle and construction, specifically low cost, and yet the Eames House was never duplicated. What makes it important architecturally, Frank? I think ideas that were used in the Eames House, ideas about building with systems, building with prefabricated elements, those ideas very much were repeated. And what makes it important architecturally? So as Frank said, uh, this opened up the thinking of architects about using systems in architecture. And what the Eames explored in their house, in the two different designs of the house, of using components to, to design and build a house, was applied by later architects. And, and I would like to uh, acknowledge my former teacher, Pat Kirkham, who famously coined a term humanized modernism when she published a book about Charles and Ray Eames. And humanized modernism, she referred to the warmth, the comfort, and also the notion of living with nature that the Eames house projected. The idea of connecting nature and architecture is really central to modernism. You see this in many, many, uh, in the work of many architects. And uh, this is something that works extremely well, of course, in Southern California because of the very mild climate, the way it's, it sits on its land, the way the space is connected to the garden. It's, it's a magical California dream. Yes, it I is. Yeah. And there, there's this other aspect of the house that um, it, it feels very lived in because it has thousands of objects that the Eames has collected on their travels. And, and today, if you walk into the house, it feels like somebody just stepped out for a minute. When Ray Eames died in 1988, she left the house to Charles' daughter. And uh, years later, it was transferred to the Eames Foundation. And you were responsible for the first phase of conserving the Eames house. What did this phase, what did it entail? Sure. Uh, I should maybe add that we were one of the people responsible for the conservation. It was a, a, a team effort. Uh, there were issues about um, uh, humidity entering into the building. Uh, there were issues with the floor. It had deteriorated. There were issues with the wood wall, the very beautiful, famous wood wall in the living room. Uh, there were issues around the windows and things like that. So in this first phase, we focused on those. So Ravi, what has to be done, what is still needed to bring the Eames House to the place where it should be? Well, there are many projects that have been identified in the conservation management plan, 
and they include things like the landscape. You know, the setting of this house is very important. And then there are other projects uh, throughout the building that uh, in coming years they will uh, address as needed. In closing a centennial year of the foundation of the Bauhaus, I would like to conclude with a look at how the famed and radical school became a brand. When searching the web, you can find many, many companies by the name of the Bauhaus, the name that Walter Gropius initially selected to suggest school for building. Tel Aviv is one example. It was named Bauhaus City despite the fact that most architects building Tel Aviv in the 30s were not trained at the Bauhaus. To explore how the legacy of the school became the brand of Tel Aviv, I invited architect and architectural historian Ellie Keller from Boston. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Daniela. So let's look at Tel Aviv as a case study. It was built in the 30s into international style, and it had a very strong political connotation at that time. What were the politics of building Tel Aviv? Yeah, so Tel Aviv is really a kind of unique and very kind of the epitome of what modernism thought itself to be. It was built, like you mentioned, mostly in the 1930s, the buildings that we call today international style buildings. There's about 4,000 of them. Most of them were built by Jewish architects that immigrated from Europe, but not only. But the case of Tel Aviv is so unique because not only was it supposed to be a new city, it was supposed to be the first new Hebrew city. And came to embody the uh, essence of the Zionist presence yeah, exactly. in Tel Aviv. Yeah. And, 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 and so it was young, you say, and it was also white. But in the 60s and 70s, everything changed. What happened? So a lot of things change on a kind of, let's say, historical political scene. Israel was going through a lot of transformations. First of all, it was already a state. In 1948, it became a state, which it wasn't when Tel Aviv was uh, being built. And with that came a lot of different things. First of all, there was a capital, which was not Tel Aviv, it was Jerusalem. Um, there was a lot of need to build new institutions that the international style didn't really fit for. And then other things happened, which happened in the life of cities, Population started leaving, there was construction built elsewhere, Tel Aviv was relatively expensive at the time, so people were living to the suburbs, and the buildings just slowly deteriorated. While most buildings were deteriorated by the 80s, we see that they started to be appreciated again. And today, Tel Aviv is named Bauhaus City. How is it really representing the Bauhaus? Well, in a way, it doesn't represent what the Bauhaus used to stand for. It has the largest collection of international style buildings in the world, and the city kind of capitalized on it and decided to brand itself as a white city, international style city. But the Bauhaus kind of came as a very easy name to remember that refers to something that people can identify with, that symbolizes a lot of things. Um, and it kind of became this brand, certain left-leaning politics, an idea of community and craft, today is simply an image. And in that sense, it's the kind of perfect brand because Tel Aviv as a city is also completely detached from what the Bauhaus was trying to stand for. It's a neoliberal city. It's the financial center of Israel. And this is why Tel Aviv is a great case study of looking at how the legacy of the Bauhaus has become brand. Exactly. In the fall, I will moderate a design talk that will focus on two of the most admired and influential residences in modern architecture, the Farnsworth House and the Glass House. Hilary Lewis, Chief Curator and Creative Director of the Glass House will participate in this event. Hilary, hi, I can't wait. I'm thrilled that we're doing this program together. Hilary, when people first look at these two houses, yes. some of them think that they are similar. 
And they're right. They are similar, but they're also different. And that's what's so fascinating. The Farnsworth House, which is so beautiful, designed by Mies van der Rohe, and built at almost the same time as the glass house, floats above the ground. It's about five feet off of the land, in part because it was built in a floodplain. And indeed, that land does sometimes flood. It's also executed in, with beautiful steel beams that are painted white. The glass house is a bit different. It also has beautiful uh, steel beams and elegant architecture, but these are painted a, a tone of black. It fades into the landscape in a different way. It doesn't jump out in the same fashion. In some ways, it's more blended into the landscape. Philip Johnson and Mies van der Rohe, the architects responsible for these two glass houses, had forged one of the most fascinating and complicated relationships in American modernism. Can we read something about this relationship looking at these two houses? There is definitely a long, complex relationship between the two men. Johnson admired Mies greatly, but he also was willing to adjust some of the ideas of Mies, and that comes through in the glass house. So, so was it a love-hate relationship? I don't want to say hate, and I can't really speak to the feelings of Mr. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, but Johnson adored Mies, but he also did not feel that he had to remain within the constraints of classical modernism. You know, I find that when you ask architects today about Philip Johnson and Mies van der Rohe, they all admire Mies. He had become this, this figure that is probably the most highly regarded architect of the modern movement. Yes. And there is a certain consensus that he was a great architect. Oh, yes. But it's not the same for Philip Johnson. I'm afraid it's not quite the same. And even Johnson, if he were sitting with us right now, would concur with you. There's no doubt, Mies was spectacular. He is truly one of the greats of the 20th century. I mean, think of it. Can you think of any example of a work by Mies van der Rohe that's not beautiful, that's not elegant, that's not successful? I certainly cannot. Johnson tried many different things, and some things were more successful than others. Those two houses, even though they look so similar, um, they were used in a very different way. One was commissioned by a single physician who was mesmerized by the fact that she could hire the world's most famous architect, but ultimately she couldn't live there. While for Philip Johnson, the glass house was his trademark, was his logo, was yes. really a symbol of his lifestyle, of Indeed. his taste. There's no question many of us would have trouble living in either the Farnsworth House or the Glass House, even though I would imagine that many of the folks who watch your show would very much be thrilled to live in the Glass House or in the Farnsworth House. It's not for everyone. It is an aesthetic uh, type of lifestyle that is uh, not as flexible. For its opening night, the Architecture and Design Film Festival screened the documentary, The New Bauhaus. It tells the story of Laszlo maholy the brilliant designer, teacher of the Bauhaus, who brought the modern movement from Germany to Chicago when founding a school called The New Bauhaus. While the school didn't last long, it left its mark on design education and design discourse in this country. Executive producer Marcus Stillwell. So, you tell this unbelievable story about a school that was founded by the Chicago Art and Industry Ministry that looked at the school as a way to get out of the depression. Thank you so much. Really appreciate being here. The, the story is so important today because. Um, two parts. One is the story of the immigrant. You know, this story was really attracted to me because I could see really embedded in this was this idea of someone coming in from another country to really bestow on us a lot of the ideas and experiences that they've had. And the other piece of this is also 
a lot of the, the untold stories of the women that were also a part of this story. Because yeah. Maholi Naj formulated a design education program which was way ahead of its time. Absolutely. I can even say as an educator that it's probably too progressive even in today's <laughs> standards. And the school yet, the school uh, closed down a year later. I would say some of the challenges with Mahoney, what made him great also made him a challenge that he didn't think about, you know, how are you going to afford to pay your teachers? How are you going to afford to have, you know, the facility and then all the supplies? So Mahoney spent half his time trying to raise money while the other half of his time trying to educate students. And again, for all the great things that he did, you know, it's also a real challenge to maintain a school. And a year later, he opened another school uh, called School of Design. Yes, and so the School of Design was, to me, the platform that allowed Maholi to really express everything um, in his vision. And he had the fortune of meeting Walter Pepke and being able to actually have the funding necessary for him to express everything. And for us, this film is a, is a celebration of patience and the process. And you show in the film right, beautifully how the principals taught in the school were really had a concrete applications. Specifically, you talk about two very well-known household name products that grew out of the principals taught at the new Bauhaus. Yeah, yeah, so in the film you'll, you'll see um, one is the little bear, the honey bear, and the examples of how that was easy to, uh, to operate. So it's the honey bear, you use it to dispense honey. And then the other one that's really famous is the Dove soap. And so there are real applications for the work that he was doing. He wasn't just experimenting, but Maholi understood that through the process that there were positive outcomes that could happen. Tell me something about the challenges that you faced in producing this movie. Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge for us is telling an authentic story about the Bauhaus without trying to be a revisionist of making it something that it wasn't. For us, we wanted to share an authentic story about Maholi, who he was messy. Um, he, he was all over the place. He lost money. He made money. Uh, he was an artist. He was so many things. And I want to tell you that everyone has their own like Bauhaus figure that they admire. Mine is Maholi Nash. Yeah, oh, wonderful. So I loved, I loved the film. And Appreciate thanks for it. coming here. Awesome, great to be here. And thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode was brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction. Thank you.